This is the public hearing of the City Council Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on bills number 180965 and bill number 180974. I am Councilman Kenyatta Johnson, Chairman of the Council's Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities. I recognize the presence of a quorum of committee members, Councilman Allen Dom, Councilman David O, Councilman Allen Toppenberger, and I also have um, just listening today is Councilwoman Blondos from O'Brown. And with that, the clerk will please read the title of the bill. A uh, bill number 180974. An ordinance authorizing the Procurement Commissioner and the Director of Commerce on behalf of the city to enter into a concession agreement for the development, management, and operation of an airport advertising program at Philadelphia International Airport, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. Would the clerk please call up the first witness on this bill? James Terrell. Can you please, both of you, st state your first and last name for the record and please begin your testimony. Robin Gibson. James Tyrell. You can begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Committee on Transportation and Utilities. Um, I'm James Tyrell, Chief Revenue Officer for Philadelphia International Airport. I am pleased to appear before you today to testify in support of Bill Number 180974. This bill will authorize the Procurement Commissioner and the Director of Commerce on behalf of the City to enter into a concession agreement for the development, management, and operation of an advertising program at the airport. The city proposes to enter into an agreement with Interspace Services Incorporated doing business as Clear Channel Airports. The scope of services will include digital and static displays in all terminals as well as some outdoor locations including roadways, bus shelters, and the exterior services of the parking garages. The agreement will have a seven-year term commencing on May 1, 2019. Clear Channel has proposed to make a capital investment in excess of $4 million. Further, the agreement provides for Clear Channel to pay a minimum annual guarantee of $3.55 million in year one, with additional increases of $50,000 per year every year thereafter. A total minimum annual guarantee throughout the term will be $25,900,000. In addition, Clear Channel is committed to 20% ACDBE participation. By way of background, the city issued an RFP on March 5, 2018 and received a total of four proposals. Each proposer was given an opportunity to present its proposal in person to the selection committee. The selection committee was comprised of members of the procurement department, commerce department, office of the chief administrative officer, as well as the division of aviation. After reviewing the proposals and appropriate deliberations, the selection committee selected Clear Channel as it provided the city with the best value. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today in support of Bill Number 180974 and respectfully request that the rules be suspended to allow for first reading at the next council session. We are available to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Now is the presence of Councilman Curtis Jones, who is here. Any questions from members of the committee? Yes, Councilman Allen Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. In your uh, testimony, yes, there were four people that responded to the RFP. Was this the highest bidder? Uh, I don't recall if it was the highest bidder. They were all within a relatively close range. Was there a bid from intersection that was $4 million more? It is possible, yes, Councilman. And why did we select this versus that? Um, I believe there were a number of criteria that were um, ranked during the selection process, and some of the criteria, as I recall, were the ability of the company to carry out a program of this magnitude, as well as the, um, the uh, 
design and implementation of the of the different elements of the program. This is a seven-year contract. Yes, sir. What's the total value uh, so, of the contract? Uh, in revenue to the city, it's a minimum of twenty-six million dollars. Total over seven years. Total. So the other bidder was at thirty million. Uh, a little over twenty-eight. Yes. And Again, that would be the minimum based on a percentage of gross. I'm just not clear as to why we would have selected somebody who was four, three or four million below another bidder. It was uh, determined to be the best value to the city because of the anticipated revenue that will be received as part of not only the minimum annual guarantee, but also uh, the percentage of gross as a result of the higher value displays that were proposed by the Clear Channel program. So you're saying Clear Channel gave us better percentages on potential additional growth? Not necessarily better percentages, but the, the selection committee, um, based on their evaluation, determined that Clear Channel's gross revenue to the city would have been more over the term of the agreement. I'd like to see a financial analysis of the bidders over the seven years and what the projections were for each one. We can probably provide you with the process that the selection kitty um, implemented and came up with, but it's part of the best value concession process that was implemented by the city. Okay, because I mean, I'm not clear why we would, unless there's real value to selecting the lower bidder, why we would leave $4 million on the table. So if you can give me that chart, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of, of questions that um, over the years, there's been an, an attempt at least to minimize our electrical consumption out there. Is that a part of this lease? Part of the Clear Channel um, proposal includes a number of um, items that specifically pertain to sustainability. Yes, they will be. Um, implementing and installing low energy uses materials as part of their program. And is that a part, that's a part of the covenant of this lease? Absolutely, Councilman. And, and do you have particular goals that you're trying to attain or? There were no specific goals identified in the RFP, but as part of the proposal process, Clear Channel did propose to utilize, again, low energy uses, uh, usage materials in their program. My, my next question as Chair of uh, Public Safety, uh, we live in a new world post 9-11 uh, where we need to rapidly be able to respond to situations that can avert or be a part of trying to avert a catastrophe such as live shooter. Is this system in conjunction with that public safety component, meaning that if I see ads that say eat at Joe's, they become uh, directional signals or, or don't go this way or shelter in place kinds of things that can help save lives. Is that a part of? So the airport has its own primary um, paging system and it is not only audio but also visual, visual paging which would direct the public to specific, follow specific directions in the case of an emergency. That system is outside of the system that Clear Channel has proposed to, to install in the airport. And that is um, inherently the airport system that provides that information. One other question. What about amber alert type of emergencies? Absolutely. The airport has an audio and visual paging system that, it, that accommodates an amber alert. That is not a part of this. It is not, Councilman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman David O. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, the, the seven-year contract, is this a renewal? It is not necessarily a renewal, but Clear Channel is the incumbent advertising concessionaire at the airport. Okay. And this contract, under this contract, the way I understand it works is they are basically going to handle all the advertising in the airport and what they're saying is that basically they're going to bring to the airport 3.7 million roughly per year for seven years. Is that correct? Yes, Councilman, that is correct. And based on their past history, that appears to be reasonable. 
Yes, Councilman. Okay, so have they made any commitments as to what they're going to provide to the airport, for example, high definition television screens, that type of thing? What are they investing into the airport so to the reach that number? The total capital investment is about $4 million in the first um, 18 months of, of the program. And yes, they have proposed um, the equipment that they intend to install in the airport, and it is high def, um, large screen uh, display monitors, <clears throat> as well as um, uh, three-dimensional uh, digital displays. Would, would you provide that to the chairman? Yeah, I'm very, very interested in seeing that. Um, it's very hard for me to understand what I'm voting on because I don't know what it compares to. I remember when I talked with SEPTA that we had a company from South Korea that would have put plexiglass across every platform so you wouldn't fall off of it. And they would also put high-definition television screens in the platforms and you could order things off of your screen. But instead, SEPTA got like uh, posters and some bad furniture. I, I just think it's just like very difficult. It was already too late for us to kind of negotiate that new contract because they already signed a contract. But what I'm saying is, I don't know what's out there when we, when we get these, and I'm not trying to do somebody else's job, but I would like to, to know that. I'm also very interested in this. Um, it looks like there is a 20% commitment to using minority and female-owned uh, companies. Is that correct? Yes, Councilman. Okay. And compared to their past history, have they complied with that? So it is my understanding that the existing contract had a sales force component um, provided by an ACDBE company um, that did actively participate in the contract. I'm not exactly sure what the total participation levels were. So the other thing that I just can't not mention is the city has, not the airport, I think the airport's been very good actually, but the city itself has got a pretty poor track record of actually using the minority and female owned companies that try to subcontract with our primary contractors? So the Office of Business Diversity actually provided a goal, I believe of 12% that was issued in the RFP when it was um, first put out on the street. Clear Channel's proposal in response to that was to provide 20%. So it's over and above the goal that was originally established in the RFP. Okay, if you could provide that to the chairman, which I understand the airport does a very, very good job with its uh, minority and female inclusion, I would just like to see that. Sure, that requirement will be part of the agreement that's ultimately entered into with Clear Channel. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? Is there anyone else here to testify on this bill? Seeing none, that concludes the public hearing on Bill Number One Eight Zero Nine Seven Four. Would a clerk please read the title of our next bill? Thank an you, ordinance Chairman. authorizing the procurement commissioner, on behalf of the city, to enter into an agreement with the Philadelphia Energy Authority to purchase electricity and certain attributes and benefits related to the generation of such electricity from a solar energy facility, Adam Solar LLC, for use at and in connection with city facilities, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. Would the clerk please call up the first panel of witnesses, please? Adam Agalico and Emily Shapira. Before the witnesses um, give their testimony, I'm going to acknowledge the sponsor of the bill, Councilwoman Blondell Sonal Brown, who will open up with a few remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, members of the Transportation Committee, Transportation and Utilities Committee. While not a, a former member of this committee, I did want to register uh, my enthusiasm and uh, anticipated excitement about the pending and hoped for uh, approval. So I want to say thank you to all of you for giving me a chance to offer a few remarks on hearing bill number 180965 which would create another historic first for the city of Philadelphia. Our city has set a goal for all city buildings to be powered through renewable energy by 2030. 
In order to achieve this goal, we must analyze the need, investigate the options, make a strategic plan, and then thoughtfully implement the plan in a responsible fashion. This power purchase agreement is part of that plan and a result of a thorough procurement process evaluated by the Office of Sustainability and the Philadelphia Energy Authority. I want to thank both of them for the incredible work required on this historic bill. It must be said that if approved, this agreement will create the single largest solar project in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. If it must be stated and repeated that if approved, this agreement will create the single largest solar project in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It will be the largest solar project in the state by sevenfold. So I join the many environmental and sustainability advocates, many of whom are represented here today, that also are excited about such an opportunity where Philadelphia will once again lead the country when it comes to creating a more greener Philadelphia for its citizens. This project offers many benefits to the city of Philadelphia. It will achieve the following. It will reduce regional greenhouse gas emissions and show leadership in fulfilling our city's clean energy and carbon reduction commitments. It will set a model for institutions, businesses, and residents to also purchase clean energy. It will create families sustaining careers and promote regional economic development in a big way. It will also mitigate risks associated with the city's electricity costs by providing stable long-term energy prices to city government for a portion of its supply. Additionally, the Office of Sustainability worked with the Office of Equal Opportunity and RFP respondents to ensure and guarantee that we have an EOP which will be in place for this project. No sustainability effort in this city should move forward an inch if it doesn't have an EOP component, ever. I am assured that community energy is committed to an economic opportunity plan that promotes minority women and disabled-owned businesses, business participation in the Adams Solar LLC with clear and strident goals and requirements. Furthermore, community energy plans to host a job fair in Philadelphia with a focus on Philadelphia-based MBEWBEs, local businesses, uh, to participate on this project. An additional fair will be held to ensure that Philadelphians are recruited for the project's workforce. So there's a workforce uh, development component to this effort as well. While the project is not located in Philadelphia, uh, my office has been assured that every effort will be done to ensure that Philadelphians are a part of the project now and going forward. Again, a huge thank you to the Office of Sustainability, to all of those who work with my staff, the advocates, and many of the experts that are joining us here today. While I am not here to hear the testimony due to another uh, competing uh, obligation, uh, my staff person uh, will be here. My hope is that I'm asking uh, this committee to look favorably upon this legislation as it is another brick in the green future that we're trying to build for the city of Philadelphia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Will the panelists please state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Good afternoon, Chairman Johnson and members of the committee. I'm Adam Agalico, Energy Manager in the Office of Sustainability's Energy Office. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on Bill Number 180965. The Office of Sustainability is responsible for the implementation of GreenWorks, a vision for a sustainable Philadelphia. The city's plan to create green, healthy, equitable and sustainable city for all Philadelphians. The plan includes action on food, air quality, energy, climate change, natural resources, waste, transportation, and economic opportunity. Last year, the Office of Sustainability released the city's first municipal energy master plan, which set goals to slash greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from the city's built environment by reducing energy consumption in buildings 20% and moving to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. On that same day, we partnered with the Philadelphia Energy Authority to release an RFP seeking to contract with a renewable energy project developer for a long-term power purchase agreement. Through a competitive RFP process, Adam Solar LLC, a project developed by Community Energy Inc., was identified as providing a project that meets all of our goals, providing large-scale clean energy, a competitive price, and a commitment to economic opportunity. 
If approved by City Council, Community Energy will design, construct, and be responsible for operating and maintaining a 70 megawatt solar facility in Adams County. This will be the largest solar project in the state by nearly sevenfold. The city, via the Philadelphia Energy Authority, will purchase all the electricity generated from the project, which will provide about 22% of municipal electricity needs, the equivalent, electricity, the equivalent of electricity use in 18,000 homes. The contract will allow the city to purchase the electricity for 20 years at a fixed rate that is competitive with today's conventional electricity prices. In this way, the project acts as a hedge against future price strikes, ensuring a portion of the electricity prices stay at a fixed low price for the life of the agreement. Neither the city nor the Philadelphia Energy Authority will own, operate, or have any maintenance responsibilities for the project. Only the commitment to pur purchase electricity under the contract. Working with the Office of Economic Opportunity, Community Energy is committed to an economic opportunity plan that reflects best in good faith efforts to incorporate minority women and disadvantaged business participation in the Adams Solar Project. Community Energy will hold job fair inside Philadelphia focused on supplying businesses for them to participate in the project. Once the subcontractors are selected, Community Energy will move forward with a second set of job fairs focusing on attracting workforce. As feasible, Community Energy's efforts will be connected to the existing solar training opportunities and specifically the recent efforts by the Philadelphia Energy Authority. This project will have an Economic Opportunity Plan Oversight Committee to ensure due diligence around contractor selection and hiring practices. In today's amendment, we've included the completed and signed Economic Opportunity Plan for the project. In addition to reducing regional greenhouse gas emissions, mitigating the risk of energy price spikes, and creating economic opportunity, the project also sets a model for other institutions, businesses, and residents to purchase clean electricity. We've already seen SEPTA issue an RFP for a similar agreement, and we believe other local institu institutions are likely to do the same in the future. For these reasons, we recommend the Adams Solar LLC project and the approval of Bill Number 180965. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. State your name for the record and please proceed. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Johnson, members of the committee, Councilman Reynolds-Brown. Um, my name is Emily Shapira. I'm the Executive Director of the Philadelphia Energy Authority. Um, I'm very excited to share the Energy Authority's strong support for uh, 180965, uh, authorizing the Procurement Commissioner on behalf of the City to enter into an agreement with us to, to purchase electricity and its environmental attributes from what would be Pennsylvania's largest solar array by a factor of seven. We believe this is not only a financially smart agreement, but also presents an enormous opportunity for trainees within Philadelphia's rapidly developing solar industry and helps the city meet its carbon reduction commitments. Our mission at the Philadelphia Energy Authority is to drive energy affordability and sustainability in our city. As you may know, in February 2016, with the leadership of Council President Clark uh, and many other members of Council, we launched the Philadelphia Energy Campaign to this end. The campaign is a 10 bill, uh, excuse me, a 10-year, $1 billion investment in energy efficiency and clean energy projects in city buildings, schools, low and moderate income housing, and small businesses citywide. It'll create 10,000 jobs and help build our city's clean energy economy. In year one, which was calendar year 2017, PEA helped create 225 jobs and launch over $50 million in energy projects. We also ran three semesters of training for high school career and technical education, or CTE, students, uh, as well as young adults in solar installation and design, energy efficiency and weatherization, and construction, safety, and lead safety basics, generously funded by PICO, Siemens, and the U.S. Department of Energy. More than 50 students have been through our in introductory class. We received an additional grant recently from the U.S. Department of Energy for $1.25 million that will allow us to create the nation's first CTE program in clean energy, preparing Philadelphia's young people for jobs in these growing industries, including those at this project. We also believe solar installation is an excellent entry-level experience to prepare young people to enter union apprenticeships in the building trades and look forward to continued partnership with the trades on that. This solar project through Adams Solar could not come at a better time. Philadelphia is now the fourth fastest growing solar market in the country, led by our Solarize Philly program, as well as serious advancements in the ease of permitting from LNI and interconnection from PICO, spearheaded by the Office of Sustainability. PEA is contacted frequently by people seeking solar training, and demand is growing in both the residential and commercial sectors. There are also new training programs for adults and returning citizens at the Energy Coordinating Agency and at OIC Philadelphia. And we're supporting a young adult training track with Youth Build Philly through our DOE grant. 
As solar booms in Philadelphia, the Adam Solar Project creates a fantastic opportunity to include active trainees and newly graduated job seekers, in particular from communities of color in Philadelphia. I wanted to also mention that we're extremely lucky in Philadelphia to have such a sophisticated and smart in-house energy staff at the Office of Sustainability. This is not very common among lots of other cities. Uh, at the Energy Authority, we're very grateful to Adam Igalico, Marty Dietz, and Christine Knapp at Sustainability for their work on this. Uh, Philadelphia has an active, thoughtful, strategic energy procurement protocol, and as a result, the city benefits from affordable power that will be even greener if we move forward with this project. In closing, this project will position Philadelphia at the forefront of clean energy development in Pennsylvania and a leader among all other cities in the U.S. It represents a win-win for short and long-term city budgets and the environment, and it also creates real opportunity for young people and for Philadelphia's economic development. We are very pleased to express our strong endorsement of this project. Thank you so much to the members of the committee and Chairman Johnson for your time today. I have a point of information, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you please speak to why 20 years, because in, in many ways that length of time is somewhat unorth unorthodox, and help us uh, understand um, why that length of this type of first time uh, initiative? There's a lot of um, good reasons why we would want to have this contract be for 20 years. I think principal among them is for this project to work from a financing perspective. Um, this, the developer needs a long-term commitment for, uh, for the project. So it's typical when these projects go through for them to be a 15 or 20 year deals because um, the uh, developer will basically take the commitment that the city is making to buy clean electricity and use that commitment to leverage and get financing for the project and actually construct the, build or construct the solar project in that case. There's a lot of other reasons why it's beneficial to us. Um, when we go for a longer term, we're able to spread out those capital costs over a longer period of time and, and ultimately get a lower unit cost for the city. Um, and in the, in the short term, it makes a lot of sense to pursue a 20-year agreement. Um, energy, electricity prices are near 15-year lows, so it's, a real, it's an attractive time to basically lock in. Mm. Um, and the investment tax credit, which is a, a federal tax in incentive that goes to renewable energy projects, uh, starts to wind down in the coming years, starting in 2020. Mm. Um, if the project does not start construction by 2019, it's not eligible for the full investment tax credit. So if solar project, um, if solar panels were to decrease in price, they'd have to outpace the investment tax credit wind down, which goes from 30% to 26% to 22%. So a uh, fairly rapid kind of wind down in terms of the, um, of, the, of the cost for the project. And that's directly uh, relevant to the price that we're paying as, at, at the city. Mr. Chairman, I want to put that on the record because on its face, uh, most of us would not understand why the investment up front is, is so uh, hefty and why the length of that investment is so necessary in order for this to work financially. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Well, uh, Councilman Allen Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I have several questions I just wanted to ask. Who prepared the uh, RFP for this uh, proposal? Yes, yeah, so the RFP was uh, developed internally, the Energy Office staff, a little bit of support from the Philadelphia Energy Authority, um, and a little bit of support from uh, the Energy Procurement Consultants. Okay. And how many people bid on the RFP? Uh, we had 28 individual projects that bid on the RFP. And was this economically the best opportunity for the city? There, we, we shortlisted a couple, um, a couple of projects and basically dug into the economics. This was in our, in our top three um, in terms of our, our economic model. Um, ultimately, it was kind of the mix of it being, and it's all, the pricing on these projects is all basically subject to what you think future energy prices are gonna do. Um, they were really, really similar for our top two, um, which this was one of them. Um, this project we felt like had a, a strong commitment to the economic opportunity plan and, and a strong kind of local tie to Philadelphia and, um, and just made sense for us from a, from a full sense of, of selection. Okay, and Adams Solar is the company you're recommending we go with? Correct, Adams Sellers, Solar is a, um, an LLC, uh, it's a special purpose entity owned wholly by Community Energy, who's the project developer. And uh, is the city investing any upfront money? No, the city um, does not invest any money up front. We only pay for the electricity we use. And this, what is the total dollars that Adam Solar is going to invest over the 
time period? The total project value? Um, it's in and around $100 million for the total million. project cost. And do we have any idea what, um, we know what our cost is going to be. And by the way, you know, my concern, as the councilman pointed out, is a 20-year commitment. I'm in favor of solar energy. My concern is if we had entered this deal 15 years ago, it would have been a very bad deal for the city, very bad. And so one of my concerns is, is there any opportunity if we see energy prices going in a direction different than what we expect to buy ourselves out of it through amortized, amortizing the expenses? So we haven't talked about a buyout option within the project. I think it's important to note, though, that this is not 100% of our electricity usage. And this, it's 22%. This, is, this is a hedge. And right. so we're typically out in the marketplace right now hedging just on a much shorter period of time. I know. But if we had sat here 15 years ago, we would have heard testimony that this is the best time to lock in, and we'd have made that deal, and we'd be saying, oh, my God, we're overpaying. So I'm just trying to protect the city's interest in the long term. I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable with 20 years. I'm trying to figure out, as an example, after 10 years, if we see it's going a different way and we can save money going in another direction, maybe we pay out 50 million, half the cost, or some amortized amount. I, I think we could, that's something we could address with the project developer. You know, we've provided a term sheet within the, um, within the, the test, or within the bill package, and it's certainly something we could talk to the developer on. Um, but it's not something that we've, uh, we've looked at or thought at in, in today's conventional uh, PPAs. Um, I should note that we're not the only ones out there purchasing um, in this fashion. If you look right. at basically any major tech company, um, they are all buying renewable ener energy and electricity right now, and it's for you know, that investment tax credit reason. So if you think about a 30% investment tax credit, are we really saying that in the next couple of years, um, uh, electricity prices are going to depress that much that we can make up that value um, for, for, for solar, which is currently one of the cheapest electricity um, modes right. available. But, but the answer is we don't know, and we didn't know 15 years ago where we'd be today. So let me ask you another question. Do you have any idea what the return, anticipated returns to Adams Solar will be by providing this to us? No, we're not, um, we're not privy to that information that's, that lives with Adams Solar and the developer. Right. But, I mean, the, so we don't know what their expected rate of return is on this investment? No, we don't. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman David O. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So this, um, this uh, facility, the solar provider, has not constructed the facility yet. It's 700 acres to be constructed in Adams County. Is that right? Correct, yes. And so when it says 75 jobs in the region, it will create 75 jobs, is that 75 jobs in the Philadelphia region or 75 jobs in the Adams County region? So I believe the way that's estimated is for the life of construction, which is uh, six to nine months, there'll be full-time 75 people working on the project. So um, it's a little bit different metric than what we traditionally talk about within the, the job creation, but it's 75 folks working on that project. For six, six to nine months. Six to nine months. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I'm looking at the workforce diversity goals and requirements. <clears throat> and it says um, minority apprentice, apprentices, 50% of all hours. Female apprentices, 5% of all hours. African-American journey purses, 22%. Asian journey persons, 3%. Hispanic journey persons, 15%. Female journey persons, 5%. Uh, who came up with these percentages? So those percentages came from the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, this was the original. City of Philadelphia? Yes, City of Philadelphia's office. Okay. I, I just note that Adams County is 95.4% white, 1.2% black, 3.6% Hispanic and 0.02% Asian. How are they going to meet their diversity goals? Yeah, I think that this is a really good question, um, and we tried to be as thoughtful as we could when we went through the office of, of, of through the procurement process for this project. Um, I think the reality is nobody in Adams County, nobody in in Pennsylvania, has ever built a 70 megawatt solar facility. Um, that expertise has got to come from someplace. Um, it's not going to be you know, all those jobs are not currently existing within, within Adams County. So 
Um, when you think about kind of developing a workforce, we already have folks that are doing solar projects. Um, we've got um, a, a fair amount of activity led by some of the work the Philadelphia Energy Authority is doing on workforce development. Um, we don't necessarily know that folks are going to be, it's going to be economically feasible for folks to bus to and from Philadelphia, but... Two, two and a half hours away. But we are going to do, again, but there's nobody there that's ever built this project either, so these folks have got to come from someplace. And so, um, you know, there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a leap to sort of say, let's, let's take our best and good faith efforts to ensure that we've got a diverse workforce and, and we've got a vendor that is committed to, to, to giving us their best and good faith efforts to do that. Yeah, I... to go mobile from one place to another. So in Philly, a lot of the installers that exist here often go to Maryland or Massachusetts, even oh, North Carolina okay. recently yeah. for builds. You know, I do understand, I appreciate it. I guess I'm thinking about like, uh, do we get this energy from Pico? Does Pico have Philadelphians working for Pico? 22% goes to Adams County for facilities that are not built yet, and we end up losing jobs in Philadelphia. Has, has, no, that doesn't happen. Well, so uh, electricity currently that we purchase is purchased on a, basically a blind bid solely based off of cost. So we don't know exactly where that electricity is coming from. It could be coming from Exelon, which is Pico's parent company. It could be coming from some of them, their generation assets. Um, but it could be coming from, um, it could be coming really from anywhere in the region. As far so. as I understand, it comes off the grid, wherever that comes mm -hmm. from. But this specifically, 22%, comes from Adam Solar. It doesn't come off the grid. It's very specific where this is coming from. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not coming kind of like off the grid from Philadelphia, Philadelphia employees, workers, and things like that. And it's not built yet. And basically, why I look at this is it looks fanciful to me. It looks like kind of like a carrot that has no, nothing to it. Your, it's numbers about 22% African American journey persons, 15% Latinos, and ultimately it's about working six to nine months, 75 people to build something two and a half hours away. It doesn't seem like a substantial thing. It seems kind of like an enticement that sounds good but is like smoke and mirrors. What do you what do you think? I mean, I think that we've got a vendor that's committed to best in good faith efforts on this project, and, um, and I'm holding them to that. We will have a project oversight committee that'll be um, you know, keeping tabs on the, on the vendor and keeping tabs on the project, you know, and doing whatever we can to you know, raise these numbers. You know, I would love to tell you that they're going to hit every single number in this. Um, I can't say that, but I do, I do believe that we're going to do kind of, again, collectively our best in good faith efforts to, to, to kind of hold them to... Uh, to, to what they've committed to in the economic opportunity plan. Okay, thank you very much. And Councilman, to your, to your first point about uh, sort of whether jobs get taken away from PICO, the electricity still sort of is, is flows through PICO, uh, so it's exactly the same as sort of how we currently buy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councilman Al Toppenberger. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Agelko, I, I have uh, one question. Maybe you didn't, I didn't hear it properly, the answer, or maybe you didn't expand upon it enough. You had mentioned the year 2019, and that and 2019 is only six weeks away. It's not that far away anymore. It used to sound far away, but no, no longer. Correct me if I'm wrong, or, or, or please uh, restate what you said on 2019, that you had said we have to get this project started by 2019 or through the year of 2019. Yeah, so through the year of 2019, year. Uh, construction has to start to fit the profile for the investment tax credit. Um, gotcha. should also note that the risk associated with that start date, you know, once we have a signed power purchase agreement, that risk lives with the developer, so, not with the city. So the clock would come to an end December 31st, 2019, Correct. if we're Correct. not starting. Okay. Yes, which is why we're, why we're really anxious today to, to, to kind of keep moving. That was a very good explanation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions yes. from members of the panel? Yes. Bill's sponsor, Councilwoman. Reynolds Brown. Thank Blando you. Reynolds Brown. <laughs> okay. I want to do a follow up to the very important questions uh, Councilman O raised around um, meeting the good faith efforts around the EOP plan. And to stay for the record that the, the company not being required to do this has, has committed to doing it, number one. Number two, I just met with, uh, for members of the, uh, of the committee, met with members of 
vendors who are actually training people in solar just last week, because I'm, I'm growing and getting my head around this as well, to learn that they, they train here and they go as far away, Councilman Owens, as, as Oregon for the installation of projects. So this is not um, uh, a, a, a new practice where they train here and then they go to those municipalities around the country that are getting in front of the world of solar energy uh, so that uh, these, once they're trained, they can uh, actually work. So I, I wanted to do a quick follow-up to that, Councilman O. To uh, Councilman Dom's question, um, uh, where he, he talked about the rate of return. Can, can, can you give us an expected rate of return? Can the vendor give us an expected rate of return? Has that been talked about? Can that be put in writing? Because it, it, uh, my staff and I live in this world. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. And so can yes. that uh, particular question he raised be addressed so that we can actually make it a part of the legislation? So, so I believe that the councilman's question was around, Councilman Don's question was around the vendor's rate of return, not the city's rate of return. Mm -hmm. um, the city, um, for its investment, we, we don't really have any firm investment. We're purchasing electricity, so all we can do is compare electricity costs um, that we would have with the project versus without the project. Okay. When we compare those, we see um, basically a, a budget neutral project oh, okay. um, across the life of the project. Um, and it could, and that's under the most conservative estimates that we can make around uh, electricity prices, as well as another number of other attributes that can contribute to the, the economics for the project. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Allen Don. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of follow-up questions. Adams Solar, um, how big of a company are they? Um, Adam Solar, again, is, a, is, a, is an entity that is owned by Community Energy, so I'm not sure that they have actual um, individuals working for them. Community Energy, um, as a company, um, got their profile here. I guess my, my concern is if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. um, how strong are they to stand behind it? Right. So um, through the, the term sheet that we've shared with you guys today, um, the... Uh, Adam Solar has got to go and seek letters of credit, basically, to, um, to, to hold as collateral in, when we sign the power purchase agreement until construction starts, and then from construction start until commercial operation, and then for the life of the, of the project. Um, if they're not able to meet certain deadlines, there's liquidated damages um, that compensate the city. So, But this is a single entity LLC? This is a, yeah, this is an So our, we're not going to be able to recoup anything because they'll just... They'll have no assets in that LLC. Well, but they'll have a letter of credit that we can pull against. How much is the letter of credit for? I believe it's, it's spelled out in the term sheet in terms of the, the megawatts. So during the, um, basically prior to construction, it's $75,000 per megawatt, so 75,000 times 70. Um, but simpler for $100,000 uh, per megawatt during the, up before the commercial operation date, so it's about $7 million. Again, we've got about a $6 million annual spend um, for electricity. I would like to know the profit margin in that business, because just, I just looked it up quickly, and it looks to me like other solar companies annually can earn from 12 to 20% a year on their uh, sources, which seems like a, a strong number. And I'm just wondering if we're gonna then get the lowest possible rate, I mean, Maybe they don't need to make 20%. Maybe if they make 10%, it's okay. But that would give us a lower rate for the city. Yeah, we can, that's something we can follow up with you on and, and okay. talk a little bit with the developer. But um, that's not something I have information on. I understand. Today. Okay. I'll be happy to work with you on that, too, to, to make that work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, this, this, this. What, what, Excuse what, me. Thank you. The sponsor so of the bill, get, Councilman Brown. I appreciate that. We get as, as much on the record as possible. You, uh, Councilman Taltenberg, I want to follow up on his question regarding the need for construction to start uh, as we move closer to 2019 because of the value of the tax credits. So can you make that, that uh, alignment for us that the tax credits are tied to the start date and the value of the tax credits? Yeah, so our... Um our interest is to get a power purchase agreement signed as quickly as possible to allow the developer as much time as possible to, to pursue the investment tax credit. The city obviously cannot take advantage of an investment tax credit. It's a, we're not a for-profit entity, um, but the developer can on our behalf. So for them to meet the, 
the deadline for the tax credit, they need to start construction prior to the end of 2019. Um, and that's all defined by rules that the IRS sets. I see, I see. Can you speak to what the value of those tax credits are? It would be, it would be. Or what drives the, 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 the number of, of the value? So it would be 30% of the total overall project cost. Okay. Um, those are numbers that the developer um, would have, but not numbers that, that we have. We're, again, kind of just a purchasing entity for electricity. Okay. But it, it works into the pro forma. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Will the clerk please call the next panel, please? Paul Spiegel, Nicholas Pevsner, Eliza Alford. Sure. Please state your name for the record. And then you can start your testimony. I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is Paul Spiegel. I'm the president of Practical Energy Solutions. Um, we work for the city as a consultant in energy efficiency and um, optimizing the energy use in existing city buildings. Um, we also work with the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and the School District of Philadelphia, as well as many other entities uh, in the surrounding area. Um, I guess I want to start with a, a really short story. Uh, in our work with the School District of Philadelphia, we actually do educational programs within the classroom for some of the students, and we do that at elementary school level, middle school, and high school level. And just last year when we were doing a class at uh, Duckery Elementary School, which is near Temple University, um, after the end of our program, the last day of the program, uh, one of the fourth graders, actually, we, we asked the class if they had any final questions before we left, uh, left their class for the last time that school year, asked if they had any final questions. One of the fourth graders raised his hand, and, and I'm going to paraphrase because he was probably more articulate than I could be with it. He said, if we have all of these sources of renewable energy, why are we still using gas and oil to generate the energy that we need for our buildings. And I didn't really have an answer for it other than people are looking just directly at the first cost of that energy and not the other impacts. There's other side impacts that are not included in the price of that energy. And that those impacts tend to lean more heavily onto people in urban areas. So uh, that can be a real issue. So. Again, part of my role and our, my company's role with the city and with our other clients is to move them towards zero carbon emissions. And we do that in three primary ways. And one is through energy efficiency, conservation, and renewable energy. So energy efficiency is getting more, uh, more out of the equipment that you have, have it be able to output more heat, more cooling, more light for less watts. Um, Energy conservation is just turning things off when you don't need them to run, and so you're con conserving and, and maybe optimizing the performance of existing equipment. So the city has developed a strategic plan for energy use to get to zero carbon emissions. Um, you can't do that just doing business as usual. It's going to take some real bold thinking and bold steps, and so the important element with that is um, just doing business as usual, again, is, is not going to get you to that goal. And, and I just want to kind of applaud the bold move that the city is looking to do now. Um, you know, leadership isn't waiting for every other city in the country to do something and then us come in and do it last. It's, you know, taking steps that other people aren't necessarily uh, maybe they don't have the will or they don't have the opportunity to do it, but this great opportunity has presented itself. And I, I hope 
that we move forward with it. Uh, people have used the number of 22% as the percentage of electricity that this solar field will generate. My hope is that with the other initiatives the city has underway, with efficiency and conservation, that we shrink that whole energy use pie and that 22% at some point becomes 50%, even just using the same amount of energy out of that solar array, but because we've cut the energy use within existing city buildings so much, now that same amount of energy is a higher percentage of the overall energy spend. Um, I do have a, a question. I, some of the questions that were asked from the la on the last panel, if it would be okay if I had addressed a couple of those as well. Um, a, a buyout option was brought up and my concern with that would be that the day you buy out, that electricity spike prices could spike just as easily as go down. And so you don't really know at any point in time what's going to happen in the long term with energy prices. But one of the really favorable things about this contract, um, we review a lot of power purchase agreement contracts for our clients, and they always have an annual escalation in the price and some of them have as much as a 5% escalation over 20 years, 5% annual escalation. Uh, at the minimum, we see a 2% escalation. This contract is a fixed price for 20 years, so you're reducing risk of all kinds of changes in electricity prices, so I think that's a really important factor to consider and to keep in mind. Um, See, the, another question was about the size of the company and um, the fact that there's a risk if they can't finish the project, but if they can't finish the project, then the city just doesn't buy the electricity from them. Um, the city is investing no money up front. You're just agreeing to buy electricity at a specific price for a specific period. If they can't deliver it, then you don't pay for it. So there is no risk there. You don't have to worry about that issue and Community Energy ran the first Pico wind program, um, ran the first wind programs here in the state of Pennsylvania 15 years ago. They've been around for a long time. They've been based in the suburbs of Philadelphia that whole time and so I feel like you're not taking a big risk in working with them. Um, I'm going to keep it short. I try to stop before people start dozing off and so if you have any questions. Uh, we're an independent consultant and have a lot of expertise in energy. I'm a professor at Temple University. I've been here in this area for my, for my whole life. Um, and I'm really excited about this project. But if you have any questions now, I, I'd be happy to answer to the best of my ability. Please state your name, title for the record, and begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Eliza Alford. I'm the Government Relations Manager for the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia, or SBN. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. SBN strongly supports this legislation and applauds it as a demonstration of the city's commitment to climate resilience and a thriving local economy. The Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia is a community of local independent businesses that demonstrates the degree to which businesses can build profitable enterprises while serving community needs, sharing wealth, and protecting the environment. Our mission is to build a just, green, and thriving economy. This proposal is the kind of aggressive climate forward action needed in the face of the negative social, environmental, and economic impacts that we are seeing as a result of climate change. Additionally, the transition to 100% renewable energy in the future provides immense economic opportunities for the city and its residents. The renewable energy industry has already created 28,000 jobs in Philadelphia and over 86,000 across the state, according to a new report by E2, SBN, and others. Investing in the largest solar facility in the state directly creates demand for more jobs and will incentivize others to do the same. Renewable energy investment also provides immense social and environmental benefits. By reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we will have healthier ecological systems, better air and water quality, fewer illnesses and deaths related to heat, air pollution, severe weather and allergens, and cleaner, safer, more equitable communities. By choosing a local values-based firm for this project, the city is advancing local economic growth and helping to build wealth in our communities. 
Local independent businesses are the backbone of a vibrant and resilient economy. They provide long-term positive economic impact. They represent more than 99% of all employer firms. They employ nearly half of all employees in the private sector. They've generated two out of every three new jobs in the United States since 1995, including during the recession, and they are more likely to, vet, to develop emerging technologies than large firms. The small local business community is the engine of a diverse and inclusive economy. Almost one-fifth of all small businesses are owned by minorities, and more than a third are owned by women. Additionally, small locally owned businesses are more likely to be actively involved in their communities and efforts to reduce their negative environmental impact than businesses headquartered outside of the communities they serve. Supporting local business also has the strongest multiplier effect. In addition to the direct impact this contract has on the economy, more money will circulate throughout our communities. A study by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance found that for every $100 spent with a local business, $45 of secondary local spending was generated. By selecting Community en Energy, a local values-based contractor that has an intentional plan to ensure an equitable distribution of the contract's benefits among women and minority-owned firms, as well as a diverse workforce, the city is making a deliberate effort to build wealth in all communities. Community Energy Inc., an SBN member for nine years, exemplifies the triple bottom line approach to business, and we were thrilled to see they were selected for this project. With this choice, the city is applying triple bottom line values to its procurement process, a shift that when applied at this scale and more broadly will radically strengthen our local economy. This project is good for our region's environment, our community's health, our local economy, and it is budget neutral or positive for the city. By voting in favor of this proposal, you would be sending the message that just like SBN, Philadelphia is committed to advancing a just, green, and thriving economy. We strongly support this legislation and urge you all to vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Please state your name and title for the record and begin. My name is Karen Melton, and I'm reading testimony uh, for Nicholas Pevsner, who's a senior lecturer in the Department of Landscape Architecture at University of Pennsylvania School of Design. Dear esteemed members of the City Council, I write in support of the City's proposed 70 megawatt solar array in Gettysburg. At the same time, I would urge the City Council to pay attention to the specific details of the project in terms of both siting and design of the installation. There can be no doubt that in this moment of runaway climate change fueled by excessive fossil fuel emissions, the deploying of renewable energy as quickly as possible is an important imperative for all societies on the planet. Philadelphia has a role to play, and this proposed solar array intended to produce clean renewable electricity for Philadelphia municipal buildings is an important step in this direction. But as we move forward with this municipal project, I would urge some attention to details. Some questions have been raised about why this solar array is being planned on prime agricultural land rather than a brownfield site. This question is valid as agricultural soils are indeed a precious non-renewable resource. But at a time when we need rapid decarbonization of our energy supply and a rapid expansion of renewable energy, let us not shoot down a solar project just because it is on farmland. Solar farms have a lifespan and can be thought of as a medium-term holding strategy for agricultural land. Given an alternative transformation, of the same parcel for a big box distribution center or suburban subdivision would be a more permanent land use change that would forever destroy the agricultural potential of that piece of land. A solar array there actually prevents such a fate. However, the way in which the solar array is designed matters a great deal and should be something that the city of Philadelphia can and should control. Examples abound of solar arrays co-developed on the same piece of land with agriculture below it, sheep grazing, certain shade-loving plants, or even bees and pollinator habitat. These are beneficial hybrid uses whereby the land remains productive and the solar panels produce energy. A poor design choice here, such as placing the solar panels at knee height and precluding any co-development uses below, would be a wasted opportunity. Finally, some consideration should be given to how the solar array presents itself from the road and the surrounding countryside. 
Is it a big monofunction industrial imposition on this patch of rural, Pen rural Pennsylvania, arranged as ad hoc across the landscape and fortified behind a chain link fence or hidden behind shrubbery? Or is it a carefully considered arrangement that welcomes local agriculture and ecological uses co-developed with local partners, exhibiting the city's care and concern for the character and uses of the surrounding countryside, while also generating clean renewable power for Philadelphia? With just a little bit of design consideration and planning, Philadelphia has a chance to set a best practice example with this solar development project the largest municipally controlled renewable development in the state of Pennsylvania. The city and rural areas are increasingly going to need one another for power, food, and work. And this infrastructural project can and should set a respectful tone for this nascent relationship. Thank you very much for your testimony. Councilman Alan Dom has questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. I just want to address the issue of the energy costs going up every year. My experience has been the opposite the last seven to 10 years. It's gone down every year. I'm just sharing you that personal experience. And the other, the concern we have, and by the way, I think everyone here is in favor of solar. Our issue is to make sure we select the right supplier and someone who can perform. And my concern would be, while it's no investment on our side, it is an investment of time. So if we pick somebody and it fails, we've lost time. And so that's our, you know, and we don't want to fail. So that's the reason for questioning that. Can I respond to that? Sure. Okay. Um, my discussion about the escalation was that in power purchase agreements for solar, typically they have an escalation clause in them where the price, even though we've been seeing falling prices on the energy markets, the prices of those proposals have had an escalation every year. We're having it flat. I, I think we're getting close to bottoming out, but no one can predict the future. Um, but at least in this solar power purchase agreement proposal, the price is flat for the entire 20 years. It's not increasing. Where a 5% per year increase, like we've seen in some of the proposals our clients have received, over 20 years, you're more than doubling the price. Right. And, and here, at least, you're keeping it flat, budget certainty for 20 years. Let me ask you a technical question, because I'm sitting here listening to all this solar energy, which is great. I'm trying to figure out in my head how uh, this plant gets built in Adams County. And I'm assuming we capture the sun's rays for the energy. Can you walk me through? from that point, briefly, how it becomes energy that the city of Philadelphia utilizes, how it gets here, just the overview. Um, they have a meter at the, at the plant showing the generation that's coming from the plant. They'll likely have to build some transformers and, and other switch gear to handle such a high load in such a remote area. Um, so, and, and that will, I think tie into the grid, but it'll be measured as it goes into the grid and then Philadelphia pulling that same amount of energy out from the grid will be purchasing that exact amount that's so, coming through that meter. There's no direct, as far as I know, there would be no direct line from that solar array to so the city. So explain the grid for people who may be watching this on TV. What does the grid mean? Um, it's the, the high tension and high power lines that send electricity long distances from the generation plants to the places that need them. Even, even now, you're, let's say you're purchasing uh, energy, your generation on the open market, whether it's from nuclear plants or coal plants or gas-fired plants, they're not from plants that are here in the city. Some of them might be in Ohio or uh, Nevada or somewhere like that. Um, but that energy goes into the grid and then it's purchased at your end. The grid is just the network of electricity that's nationwide uh, for carrying electricity long distance. Um, then from there, there's a, those are the transmission lines. There's a distribution line and that's what PICO manages here. PICO does not manage generation uh, of electricity. They just manage the distribution to the individual ratepayers, to their the houses, the businesses, 
and it's measured at a meter at their location for what they use. Um, the grid is managed, actually the regional grid in this area is managed by PJM, whose headquarters is in King of Prussia, and they have a control center that manages not just um, actual delivery of electricity, but they bring on other generation facilities when the, the demand is getting really high, especially during uh, hot summer days. Um, and, and, they have a, and they actually manage solar assets as well, especially a large plant like this in their region is gonna affect their, because it's, a, it's something that comes online as the sun comes up and it hits its peak in the middle of the day and then tails off towards the end of the day. Is there a transportation cost difference between Adams County and uh, buying energy from California? They're still just putting it into their grid there. There, there are some line losses uh, of transporting electricity um, within the grid, but you're still, even if we're buying it here from a firm in California or a generation plant in California, it's not coming all the way here. It's actually getting into their grid. And the, yes, I'll let Adam. I just wanted to address your question. So the project that we have um, lined up, uh, the city is taking delivery and, and ownership of the electricity in the Pico zone. So we're taking ownership of that electricity in Pico territory, meaning that the developer owns the risk associated with transporting that electricity from the project to the city of Philadelphia. Okay, and uh, just moment, while you're up here, I have one last question now. We did look at the possibility of sites in the city for this. Yeah, so there's a, there's a very different kind of project to do if we're looking at city-owned city assets or even kind of local assets for uh, renewable energy. Um, one of the challenges is just the, the sheer size of the project. Um, 700 acres is roughly twice the size of FDR Park, about 500 football fields. We don't have land availability um, to that size. And so when we think about this project, we're really thinking about it as how do we influence the regional um, energy system, much like we think of a local food system. This is a local energy system, and we need right. to develop all aspects of it. But we will have opportunities, we think, in the future to look at our own assets for um, renewable electricity, solar panels on our own buildings. It's just a very different project, because now we're talking about roof condition, leasing out our space, and, um, and what are our future plans for those, for those facilities. I mean, I only ask that question because I would rather see the construction jobs go to Philadelphians. I'd rather see the jobs there go to Phil. I'd rather see you go to the city. That's why I asked the question. It, and it's a great project, and it's something we want to do. It's, it's just a very different project. And to reach the scale of 22% would be really challenging within, um, within the city of Philadelphia for kind of a first time out of the gate on a power purchase agreement. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Can the clerk please call up the next panel, please? Joe Minot, Matthew Stepp, and Amy Cornelius. Please state your name and title for the record, please, and begin your testimony. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of uh, City Council. And thank you, um, Councilwoman Brown, for sponsoring this bill. Uh, my name is Eric Chung. I'm the Deputy Director of the Clean Air Council. So um, my, my boss, Joseph Otis Minas, is the Executive Director. He couldn't be here because of a conflict. So if it's okay, I would like to read his testimony in. But th these will be his words that I'm reading in. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Joseph Otis Meinitz and I am the Executive Director and Chief Counsel of Clean Air Council. Clean Air Council is a nonprofit environmental health advocacy organization whose mission is to protect everyone's rights to a healthy environment. The council has 37,000 member activists, including many in Philadelphia. The council has been advocating for clean air, clean air for over 50 years. Clean Air Council is extremely excited that Philadelphia is planning to enter into a power purchase agreement that would result in the construction of Pennsylvania's largest solar facility to date uh, to power city government electricity needs. 
This is a significant amount of new solar that would be built at a time when the world's top scientists are calling us to rapidly transition to a carbon-free energy sector. According to the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, we only have 12 years to cut greenhouse gas emissions 45% by 2030 to avoid catastrophic climate change. We must make unprecedented, rapid, and aggressive transitions in our energy infrastructure to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. This solar PPA is one important first step in making sure that Philadelphia is taking care of its responsibility to make that transition. Every megawatt of clean rene renewable energy the city is adding to our grid will help displace electricity generation sources that create poor air quality and exacerbate climate change. Mayor Kenny and the Office of Sustainability are demonstrating strong leadership by being the first ones to enter into a contract this big in our region. While the solar facility would be located in Adams County, the city deserves a lot of credit for working with Community Energy on an economic opportunity plan in which the, com the company pledge, uh, pledges to make their best and good faith efforts to ensure a diverse workforce, including minorities, women, and disabled individuals. The combination of an EOP oversight committee to ensure due diligence around contractor selection and hiring practices with re recruitment efforts by community energy at job fairs and connections with existing workforce training programs in the city are great, great ways to ensure a diverse workforce. Not only is, there solar, is the solar project great for air quality and for addressing climate change, but it makes good fiscal sense too. The cost of the project is competitive with other energy sources and is the same or even cheaper than a variety of future energy prices. This ensures that the city will mitigate risks of future electricity price spikes by locking in lower fixed prices uh, for a 20-year time period. This solar facility is the first of many projects that will, that will need to be built in order to get the city of Philadelphia to its committed goal of 100% renewable energy by 2030 and, and to achieve more than 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 compared to 2006 levels. I expect that this project will pave the way for the city to develop agreements for future solar projects to be built in the Philadelphia region that could also provide a number of good paying jobs to Philadelphians. I hope other institutions such as universities, universities and hospitals will be encouraged by this model and I urge them to follow quickly to develop similar arrangements. Cleaner Council fully supports the, purchasing, uh, the, per the power purchase agreement and I urge city council to approve the agreement as soon as possible by voting yes on Bill 180965. Our window to address climate change is closing. Let's act as quickly as possible to adopt this agreement and move on to the next pieces of Philadelphia's transition to renewable energy. Thank you for your time and consideration. I've also left copies of the testimony um, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please state your name and title for the record? Uh, my name is Amy Cornelius. I'm the owner of a sustainability consulting firm here in the region, and I'm a member of the Policy and Advocacy Committee of the Green Building United group. Uh, Chair, Chairperson Johnson and members of the Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities, I thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Green Building United in support of Bill 180965, authorizing the Procurement Commissioner on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to enter into a long-term agreement with the Philadelphia Energy Authority for the purchase of electricity. As a nonprofit organization committed to fighting climate change, Green Building United wholeheartedly supports this power purchase agreement. While we're, we're a building-focused organization, the impact of energy efficiency we promote in buildings is greatly enhanced by the complement of zero emissions energy sources like solar energy. This agreement demonstrates the city's strong commitment to reaching its ambitious energy and car carbon reduction goals, creates the largest solar photo photovoltaic project in Pennsylvania by a factor of seven, provides for 22% of the city's municipal electricity needs, a major step toward reaching its 100% renewable electricity goal by the year 2035 offers a price for carbon neutral electricity that is cost competitive with conventional prices and is locked at this low price point for a 20 year term. 
serves as a model for leadership for other major institutions to seek their own off-site power purchase agreements for renewable energy, helps the Commonwealth reach its goal of increasing solar, solar generation to 10% of in-state electricity consumption by 2030, as outlined by Finding Pennsylvania's Solar Future Coalition. It is critical to the project timeline that this legislation passes before the end of the calendar year. Federal tax credits associated with renewable energy are set to begin to expire in 2020, and community energy must start construction in 2019 to fully qualify for these tax credits. Delays in the project schedule could, could impact its quoted price. We thank you for your consideration of Bill 180965 and our testimony. We hope that you will, be favor you will favorably pass this bill out of committee today and encourage the full council to pass this bill by the end of this calendar year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from members of the panel? All right, thank you for your testimony. Will the clerk please call up the next panel, please? Dave Moscatello. Minal Rival, Mitch Chanin, and Karen Melton. So. There's four of us. <laughs> Please state your name record for please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is David Moscatello. I'm a West Philadelphia resident and I'm speaking today on behalf of Philadelphia is Ready for 100, a uh, campaign of the Southwestern Pennsylvania Group of the Sierra Club. Uh, with the goal of obtaining 100% of our uh, energy from clean, renewable sources. And I'd like to thank the committee uh, for the opportunity to speak in favor of bill number 180965 today. Um, raising awareness and building the demand for renewable energy at the municipal level is our current best option. Nations like Sweden, Norway, and Costa Rica are leading the way with commitments to achieve 100% renewable electricity, uh, energy. Mayors, including Mayor Kenny, in 203 cities across the United States have pledged to move their cities to 100% clean renewable energy. Across the nation, 82 cities, nine counties have committed to achieving 100% renewable electricity between 2030 and 2050, most of these targeting 2035. Two states, California and Hawaii, have already committed to uh, achieving 100% renewable electricity by 2045. A number of cities in the country have already achieved 100% renewable electricity, including Burlington, Vermont, Greensburg, Kansas, and Georgetown, Texas. The point is that American cities and states are mobilizing under the 100% renewable banner. Philadelphia has a chance to participate as a leader, one of the first major cities on the East Coast to blaze the trails to renewables, and the proposed power purchase agreement project is an important step in ensuring a sustainable future for Philadelphia, but just a small step towards addressing the urgent matter of global climate change. To put things in perspective, uh, uh, given our, uh, our renewable energy in Pennsylvania, uh, for reference, New Jersey has 2,526 megawatts of solar capacity installed, sixth in the nation. And in comparison, uh, Pennsylvania, almost six times the area of New Jersey, has only 386 megawatts total installed, 22nd in the nation, and 0.2% of our electricity supply. Pitiful. The 70 megawatt farm to be built by, via this PPA in Adams County, um, not merely the uh, seventh, uh, seven times larger than the uh, largest solar installation in the state so far, is a move in the right direction. Without projects like this, achieving the mayor's pledge of 80% carbon emissions reduction by 2050 um, isn't going to happen. And more importantly, the city and state will be at risk. We support this solar project and hope that this is but the first of many such projects. 
We're allies in this project and we're committed to fight for renewable and sustainable energies, especially as we face a federal administration that refuses to acknowledge that climate change is a genuine man-made threat. That said, we need to ensure that this and future projects are constructed in the most environmentally sensitive manner feasible, targeting brownfields, strip mines, rooftops, parking lots, and other already degraded areas before clearing forests or covering productive agricultural lands. As City Council, you all have a great deal of leverage in this conversation, and you have the power to mobilize local businesses to pro and promote uh, and educate in renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind, local energy storage, electric-based heating and transportation. The City of Philadelphia can make enormous strides in energy efficiency, which will save Philadelphia citizens and government uh, agencies an extraordinary amount of money. While this particular project won't create as many jobs for Philadelphians as local projects obviously would, um, it will create jobs and tax revenue in Adams County, which to council may seem um, like not much. But it can't hurt for Philadelphia to make it clear that our commitment to clean energy can benefit Pennsylvanians across the state. We need any uh, good cred we can get in Harrisburg, I'm sure. Um, and statewide, we could see uh, an increase of over 14,000 jobs per year if the state per pursues a, a goal of 100% of renewable energy between now and uh, the next few decades. At about four and a half cents per kilowatt hour, it will save the money, uh, the city money. Um, I note that some concern was raised about how much this price could drop. The lowest prices um, for solar um, put forward in the U.S. have been about a two and a half cents per kilowatt hour, but that's in a state like Nevada, which gets a lot more and more intense sunshine than Pennsylvania does. So it's unlikely that uh, the rates will drop um, so substantially that it would be a problem uh, for this 22 percent of municipal electricity. Um, that said, we want to emphasize that we must also have a rapid and large increase in energy efficiency in solar projects here in the city because we want to create jobs uh, in the city and, and to demonstrate on the ground our commitment to clean energy. And we understand this issue is complex because it's not only an issue, a question of careful planning, but because the impacts of climate change are going to first affect citizens relegated to the poorest uh, neighborhoods of Philadelphia. And the recent IPCC report emphasized how little time we have to act. Um, that's why we fight for 100% uh, renewable energy is a fight that must include everyone. Um, we're ready to build coalitions with economic leaders, label group, labor groups, and social inst institutions. We're ready to work, we're ready to be your partners, and our hope is that Philadelphia will continue to act as a national leader and continues to make us proud in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelist, please. Yeah, hi. I'm Mina Ravel. I'm active with many of the groups here today, including Philly's Ready for 100 team. Their goal is 100% renewables, and the 350 Philadelphia team. 350's goal is to reduce our carbon emissions across the planet down to 350 parts per million. It's currently hovering around 410. Um, we are thrilled to hear of this project for the 70 megawatt solar for municipal operations. But did you know that this um, well, you do know that this is to be the largest solar project in our state. This is indeed something to be proud of, but did you know that 70 megawatts is a small project in other states? Ohio has 400 megawatts of solar projects approved uh, and about a 900 megawatts in the pipeline, pending approval. In New York, there's over 1,600 megawatts of solar going in this year, solar, wind, and solar, and storage. Um, um, any of you wonder why we're not developing the renewable energy field by leaps and bounds like our neighboring states? Um, I'll tell you. The gas industry, pumping out gas from the Marcellus Shale faster than current consumption, has been actively, aggressively seeking out markets for their product. So the reported reduced emissions from our electric grid and their cheaper rates um, is thanks to fracked gas replacing coal power plants. It's also possible to replace coal power plants with a mix of renewables and storage, offering not just reduced emissions, but zero emissions. 
Um, development in this area, though, has been suppressed and political leadership twisted towards supporting gas projects. To build a market base, the price of gas has been kept artificially low, resulting in artificially low electricity rates for large customers like the city of Philadelphia, which is why you've seen prices going down, Mr. Dom. Um, Pico's price to compare for each of our homes is about 6.8 cents a kilowatt hour, um, and the city's been paying 4.5 cents. This financial factor has also made it hard for renewables to compete in Pennsylvania. Um, we've been subsidizing the gas industry while demanding or expecting that the renewables industry mature and thrive without subsidies. We need you as our city council to approve only zero emissions energy projects. The primary resistance we've heard about this project from other people that couldn't make it here today is why plow over agricultural land? To ease this concern, let's specify that this project design include a coexistence with agricultural uses, be they pollinator-friendly farms, solar farms that allow for grazing, or solar farms that include crops beneath the panels. The rate at which we deploy new renewable energy must be hastened. Of concern is the decommissioning of Three Mile Island, the nuclear generation plant, next year. This zero emissions 800 megawatts of electricity must be replaced with 800 megawatts of zero emission capacity from renewables, wind, solar, and storage, not gas. Um, the technology exists, the skills exist, all we need is you on our side, so that we as a region um, will no longer consider any project that has emissions from, quote, clean burning gas, which it's not, or anything else. The emissions we are responsible as a city are the 508,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent from our municipal operations. We need to lead by example and get this number down to zero. How do we do that? First, with goal setting. We have a hearing next month, I think, with Julian leading on that. Um, oh, at the end of this month, I think. Um, second, with planning, with smarter management, Paul re referenced this, uh, we can reduce at least 25% of, of our current energy usage um, and our equivalent emissions. And lastly, with action, this 70 megawatt project is an example, excellent example of an action we can support. It should reduce our city emissions by about 11%. Let's go and do this and more. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thanks. My name is Mitch Channon. I serve on the steering committee of 350 Philadelphia. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to present testimony today, um, Chairman Johnson and other members of the committee. Um, much of what I had to say has already been said, and I don't think you need to hear repetitive testimony. Um, so I'm going to depart a little bit from what I um, had planned to say and not try not to cover the same points that everyone else has already made. Um, but I want to say that um, as Meenal was saying, 350 Philadelphia is an organization that's devoted to um, a rapid and just transition from all fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas to clean renewable energy across Philadelphia and around the world in order to avert catastrophic climate change and to protect people from the health impacts of air pollution. Um, and we desperately need leadership at every level of government in that fight, local, state, and federal. And um, we strongly, in 350 Philadelphia, support this proposed solar power purchase agreement as one of the key ways that the city of Philadelphia can take leadership in protecting a livable climate. Um, it's really essential that we get to zero emissions as quickly as possible. And this project will not only um, reduce emissions by the amounts that people have described, but create momentum in really important ways towards an accelerated deployment of renewable energy around the state. Um, a number, I think as someone was saying before, this, this kind of purchase, power purchase agreement is already, already very common in the private sector. Um, Google, for example, has already achieved 100% renewable energy worldwide for all of its data centers and other facilities using um, some similar, some similar uh, means of purchasing electricity. Facebook, Amazon, and a host of others. Um, the municipal sector is a little bit later to that game, but we think it's definitely time for local governments to, to get into it. Um, uh, whether or not this uh, 
How well this represents public opinion, I can't say, but when we, in our network, shared the news that the city was considering this project, there was enormous excitement about it and enthusiasm. People desperately want this to happen, um, in, at least in our circles here in Philadelphia. Um, I want to just very quickly address a couple of economic concerns that were raised. Um, it's already been said that um, the project would provide a fixed cost for electricity for 20 years, which I think is very important. Um, a few years ago, the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a, a very reputable and large scientific organization, rated Pennsylvania, one of the states that was at greatest financial risk um, in the US for over-dependence on natural gas as a source of energy. Gas prices are very low now but they are historically quite volatile, and there's um, considerable um, reason to be concerned that those prices could spike uh, beyond what people are expecting in the coming years. And so Union of Concerned Scientists rated Pennsylvania one of the states that's at greatest risk because so much of our electricity comes from natural gas and because the gas industry is building so many power plants. Um, as LNG exports step up, and the markets for gas expand, but the supply may become constrained, I think there's a significant risk of price spikes in the coming years, and this project would protect us against that. I'd be happy to share that report with the committee if you'd like to see it. I didn't, didn't think to bring it. Um, and lastly, um, um, maybe addressing Councilman Dom, your concern. Um, as you were saying, 15 years ago, I think you're right, buying a long 20-year power purchase agreement for solar energy 15 years ago would have been a pretty bad deal financially. Um, prices for solar energy have declined, I would imagine, at least 90% since over that time. Um, they're now about, uh, this price is 4.4 cents per kilowatt hour. I think it's unlikely that they will decline by a significant margin in the near future. There's not that much lower they can go. And um, the cost of the equipment is declining as a proportion of the total cost of the energy. And the cost of labor is rising as a proportion. And so even if the prices for the panels themselves drop, um, you know, if we want people to be paid a fair wage, prices for installation cost are not gonna come down significantly. Um, so I wholeheartedly support this project. 350 Philadelphia and everyone in our community wholeheartedly supports this. And um, we hope that you'll approve the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else on here to testify? Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. My name is Karen Melton. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. I strongly support the power purchase agreement and the large solar farm that will be constructed. I want to also call your attention to a problem that while the city has adopted goals for moving us to all renewable energy, we still have city and regional agencies building or planning to build new fossil fuel projects in this city with operational horizons of 20 and 25 years. Specifically, the gas-fired power plant SEPTA is currently constructing in Nicetown against the wishes of the community and the LNG expansion proposal that is shortly to come before the Gas Commission, which includes two council members, and if approved by the commission, will then come before City Council. We cannot afford the luxury of some agencies rowing forward while others are rolling, are rowing backward. Uh, just because there are fossil fuel projects that might be financially viable in the short term. We are out of time to address climate change. I urge you to move forward in approving this project and at the same time to vote down new gas and LNG infrastructure fossil fuel projects that come before you. And please use your leverage to discourage projects where you do not have a direct vote. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, can Adam Agalico come back up, please? Uh, one of the committee members would like to ask. Her. Thank you all for your testimony. Appreciate it. <laughs> Chair recognizes uh, Councilman Dom. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon again. A couple of quick questions. In, in your opinion, is the demand, uh, PGW's demand, down? 
today from three years ago? PGW? Yes. Um, I'd have to look. Probably not from last winter because it was a pretty cold snap. But okay. And with it, any benefits with the solar energy? Would that take from PGW? No, I can't see how this would impact PGW. No impact. No. Okay. And then the other question I have is, how many jobs do you think are created on an ongoing basis out in uh, whatever in the Adams county? county? Adams County. So uh, the project, once it finishes construction, it's it's a minimal kind of operations phase. So typically, there's a couple of individuals that are working to maintain the site, clean the panels, mow the lawns, things like that, um, repair fencing. But uh, it's not a we're not talking about dozens of jobs, maybe you know, two or three. Right, but we're talking about $100 million of construction. Yeah, the construction, and I think it's important to know when we're talking construction, uh, you know, almost half of that cost is the solar modules. Another significant portion of that cost is associated with um, inverters and other kind of specialty equipment. So while there's a really big price tag for the overall project, um, you know, a lot of that is just equipment. Let me ask you a basic question, because I'm not aware, but... I, I see it all the time. Driving into Atlantic City, you see all these windmills. Is that solar energy? Uh, no, it's wind. Wind. Have we looked into that? Uh, so uh, we have not. We, when our RFP went out, we put it out as renewable energy. We didn't specify solar, hydro, or, um, or wind. We did get some responses that were wind projects. Um, ultimately, uh, this solar project made more sense because it was in closer proximity. Um, I think in the coming years, you might see some opportunities off the coast of New Jersey for offshore wind starting to become economically viable. But for us, you know, we, we talked about two and a half hours being kind of a, a decent distance to go. There's probably some opportunities within that window, within that range of Philadelphia for wind, but not, not tons of opportunity, whereas there's a lot more opportunity for solar. And this capacity in Adams County right now that will provide 22%? Is there an opportunity if we wanted to increase that capacity for them to supply it? So for this project, um, there's an opportunity to increase it by another 10 megawatts. Um, that's something we have been considering, but not something that we've, uh, we've actively decided on. Uh, the project is in the PJM um, interconnection queue for 80 megawatts. Right now, the city is looking at 70 megawatts for the opportunity. And have, did we look at, and this, when we started this process, the ability, I know we talked about this, to try to figure out how it can be done in the city in some way, even if it doesn't, if it's fragmented into different sites, and have we looked at even have, hiring our own consultant where the city would actually own this entity and, get, and receive the benefits that could even go to the pension fund as an example? <laughs> So um, city ownership, let me address the city ownership and then go city ownership of this asset wouldn't be beneficial. Um, we wouldn't be able to take advantage of the federal investment tax credit, a 30% tax credit as a, as a you know, nonprofit okay. entity. So it, it's, it's not a fit for this. You know, as the investment tax credit fades, fades out, that, that might be an opportunity for us to look at. Uh, for city-owned assets and city-owned land, um, again, we think there is opportunity, but not at the scale and impact that we are looking to accomplish through this project. So it's something we, we're going to try to do in the future um, on some of our municipally owned assets. But it's it's a different project, and I, I keep on saying that because of the um, you've got to understand the structural integrity of these assets. You've got to make sure that you're going to hold them for a long period of time because you're leasing um, space on them. Um, typically, the city does own onto its buildings and some of its assets for a long time, but this would really kind of limit our ability to transfer some of those right. things away. I think my only, my only concern, I'm in favor of the solar 100%, I would only love to see it happen in our city and our people benefit from those jobs. That, I mean, going to Adams County to me is like two and a half hours away. Why we, why we can't try to figure this out in the city? Yeah, I think it's it's a question of space, really, too. We When we put out our RFP, we had 28 responses. Um, you know, short of using our own assets and housing solar panels on our own assets, you know, none of those projects were really in close proximity. And that's partially because land is valuable. Um, you, you, to find 700 acres of space that is, you know, either underutilized or, um, or available and folks are willing to lease out for an extended period of time, um, that's that's not very easy to do, you know, in the in the near counties and um, or in or in the city itself. So um, you need to find, you know, a, a, a more kind of 
uh, cost-effective land, and um, to do that, you end up going a little further out from the city, which is w where we ended up on this project. Is there any potential of a structure of a partnership with this company where the city owns a portion of the company and in exchange offsets the tax credits to them? We haven't addressed something like that. We could certainly talk to the developer. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Giving them the tax credits, we make the investment, we work out some sort of an arrangement that benefits the city. I mean, I think we are getting um, benefits to the city, and I, I really, I, the, the economic opportunity plan that has been presented is, um, you know, it was the result of us really going forward from the very intent. When we put out the RFP, we talked about the economic opportunity plan being a priority for the city. Um, we've got a vendor that's committed to that economic opportunity plan, and, and we do think there's going to be Philadelphians, you know, employed by this project. But I'm talking about the city actually having an ownership interest in the solar company, and maybe the city does take a big, big piece and becomes a big leader in the country for solar, and it'll benefit the city in the long run. Yeah, I, I'd have to look into that. I know that the projects, um, you know, they're, they're, the power purchase agreement is designed to be uh, basically financed. And that's, that's, the, that's the driver of this arrangement. That's one of the reasons why we don't have specific contractors is, is because they need to secure the financing before they'll move forward. So Yeah, but the credit of the city, I can guarantee you, is going to be a much lower interest rate probably than the credit of an LLC. Yeah, and that's something we can, we can certainly talk to folks okay. about. But, um, but the investment tax credit would be the main, I think, potential barrier to something like that working. So. Are those investment tax credits saleable? I, I'm not... Positive. I believe you've got to have equity ownership in the, in the okay. entity to take advantage of it. Oh, but you follow where I'm going. I'm trying to have, benefit the city as much as yeah. possible. Yeah, I understand. Okay, thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there anyone else who want to make comment on this particular yeah. bill? Yeah. Okay, I will now uh, acknowledge the sponsor of the bill, Councilwoman Blanos from Nose Braille. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to all the members of the committee for your extremely thoughtful uh, uh, concerning questions, because philosophically, we're all on the same page. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but like many uh, members of the committee, we have to temper our enthusiasm with trying to figure out how we get it right with, where the biggest beneficiary are Philadelphia citizens who want to work. That's a, we care about people in Greene County, but we get elected to represent, lift up, support, and be cheerleaders for residents right here uh, within the city of Philadelphia. And while corporations are doing great, they, could, they, get, they have the, the revenue to take the risk. We have to be more thoughtful uh, and measured when we want to take on exciting new uh, uh, sustainability efforts like this. And because Philadelphia is the first, we really have to be thoughtful in how we make this work in a responsible way. So I want to thank my colleagues for the a number of questions that were raised, which were very, very important, and um, thank them for allowing us to move this forward with this proviso. I will need to have the Office of Sustainability, the Office of uh, the Energy Authority for us to sit and talk further with Councilman O and Councilman Dom because the answer to many of the questions was we really should talk about that. So we're going to really talk about that uh, in greater detail, hopefully next Tuesday, um, because Wednesday is, is uh, pre preparation for Family Day. Um, so the bottom line is I, I thank you all, but we still have a lot of homework to do before we get to uh, the 29th. Okay? Hello? Yes. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the public hearing for Bill number 180965. We will now move to a public meeting to consider action for the bills that have been heard today. The chair recognizes Councilman Curtis Jones on Bill number 180974. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that bill number 180974 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at our next session of council. Second. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Bill number 180974 will be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation with the request that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at the next session of council. The chair 
recognizes Councilman Curtis Jones for a motion on Bill Number 180965. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to offer an amendment to Bill Number 180965. Five, a copy of that amendment has been circulated to all members of this committee, and I move for the amendment's adoption. Second. There's a motion to amend Bill Number 180965. Will all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye? Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Bill Number 180965 will be amended. The chair recognizes Councilman Curtis Jones for another motion on Bill Number 180965. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that Bill Number 180965, as amended, be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation, and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at our next session of council. Second. All those in favor by saying signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Bills number one, bill number one eight zero nine seven four will, will be repeated from this committee with a favorable recommendation with the request that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at the next session of council. This concludes our public meeting. This hearing will stand in recess to the call of the chair. And I just want to thank everyone for their participation.